it's uh, finishing ahead of everybody on a regular basis on the contest uh, floor is Jonathan Kinchin. And he's been on, of course, with us in the morning. He joined us uh, from Vegas during the NHC broadcast. And he joins us now tonight uh, to talk about uh, a, a topic that he seems to be way out in front on, uh, and that is psychology of the horse player. Jonathan, good evening. Hey, how you guys doing? Excellent. Turn turn that radio down or the uh, computer down. Yeah, I don't, it's not mine. Who's who's? Where's that coming from? <laughs> Jeremy. And he joins us now tonight to, to talk about uh, a, a topic that. It's kind of funny. <laughs> but, uh, Jeremy, it's not coming from you either, huh? No, I'm in sheer silence. That's pretty funny. All right, there we go. Uh, there was some sort. Of, that was that was uh, that was interesting. I thought. Uh, that was the, one of those classics, uh, one of those classic sports talk moments. Jonathan, <laughs> it's great to get you back. And uh, I thought uh, that you were a natural for this conversation because uh, you just tune out all the extraneous and you seem to get into a real zone and you focus in on your handicapping approach and it's resulted in you know just one great performance after another whether it's a regular horse play or whether it's the contest scene talk about uh, the mental approach and the makeup the mental makeup uh, for you know your own day-to-day play yeah no i i think for me it's like uh, well, part of the success has been preparation i mean i get up uh, on like tournament days i'll get up at at 4 30 or 5 at the nhc i got up at 3 30 and I'll try to do all of my work then when I'm not occupied with people around me, with minutes to post, to people cheering, to um, getting beat in a race. And I try to get my plan together so that when, when, when the bullets start flying and the bombs are going off, it, the work has already been done. And I think that that's helped me because the times where I've been a little bit behind and I've played tournaments on the fly, I don't do nearly as well. Um, if I get down early, I get I get down on myself, and I and I start reaching and doing things I wouldn't normally do. But it's the times when I feel like I get a head start on it, where I get up and I and I get an idea of what's going on. I think preparation is the biggest biggest thing for what's been going on with me lately, and I and I would recommend that for everyone is don't don't look at the at the sixth race <laughs> with 28 minutes to post. Like that's the worst thing to do. It's gonna it's not gonna help you out. Look at it in the morning, and then just make final decisions and adjust. Talk about the difference uh, in terms of approach between a contest mentality and a bankroll mentality. Yeah, so what I've found in the last year is I am so much better of a player like now that I started playing in tournaments than I was before. It's it's taught me so much. Um, I'm a fan of the sport first. Um, for the people that have seen some of my tattoos, I've got tattoos of like some big horses, and we can talk about that. But <laughs> so I'm a fan, and so when 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 Zinata's running or Rachel's running or I, the value, I don't care about value. I, I just want to be a super fan, and I want her to win. I'm going to single her and pick fours, and that's not always the best approach. And I've and I've and I've had to teach myself that, and I think tournaments has helped me help me do that. And so. Um, it's kind of turned a little bit. It's, it's made me – I've tried to stop hoping for things to happen and play things that are likely to happen. You know, I'm not going to just hope that a 30-to-1 hits the board and makes my try good. I'm only going to play things that I think have a good chance of happening. And I found myself spending a lot less money on, on silly combinations um, and, and, you know, that, that might not work and that might not be good. And so that, that's – that's been that was, that's been one of the hardest things for me to overcome is my fandom of the sport and of horses and falling in love with horses, which I know we all do. We all have a pet horse that we continuously throw our money at, and they continuously let us down. But for some reason, we can't stop loving them. And so um, I've tried to divorce myself from that a little bit. And that's a tremendous, a tremendous point. And there's you you bring up a a, a sidebar to a hmm, an area that I haven't talked about in a long time personally but is really germane to that and when you start to when you start to get involved in the game and whether it's building a preference or a, an affection for horses from a certain barn 
and simultaneously, to balance that out, uh, disdain for certain barns. And there's an opportunity to let it cloud your judgment in both directions. And that it will never be good for the bottom line. Absolutely. I have some writers like that. I won't name them, but there, there are some writers that I just say, nope, I'm out. <laughs> so, and they've, that's bit me, it's bit me a few times. Uh, and that you know that we it's funny because there, there there's been a couple of of moments where uh, in fact over the weekend and there's some discussions that came out of it from Saturday's play where you know long priced horses with bug boys or you know with riders that are you know lower percentage single digit win percentage type you know type trainers or uh, riders they win races they they're they're th- these are still professionals you know uh, they, there's there's still bucky dents that, that that can win world series with home runs and, and uh so uh, just because somebody isn't necessarily a, a, a guy that you see winning you know very often in in certain circumstances you, you can't discount the chances there and and you know these Jonathan are are kind of an additional layer of frustrations that can then build into a a, a protracted series of beats you know because you make a bad decision on that basis then suddenly you lose a photograph then suddenly uh, your horse uh, through no fault of its own gets in a jackpot and you know next thing you know you've you've lost three four five bets in a row and you're muttering and you're kicking yourself and you got a problem on your hands well, I think it's important for everyone to realize, like, we're going to lose more races than we win if you're playing correct. Even if you're not playing correctly, if you're just playing all favorites, you're going to lose more races than you win. And so you want to make the races that you lose um, things that you can't control. Um, when it's things you can control, like you didn't look at the replay, you didn't see that the horse went seven wide, seven wide, and then now was drawing the rail and going to save all that ground, and you get beat by that. To me, that's when I get frustrated as it being unacceptable for me to get beat in those situations. I'm going to get beat by bad trips. I'm going to get beat by bonehead rides, by pace meltdowns. I'm going to get beat when there's they're going a mile on the turf and it looks like no one's going to go to the front and 75 of them go to the front and then I get closed on from behind. That's going to happen, and I don't let that get to me. But I do do not take well when something that I've done, being lazy or not being prepared, gets me beat. And so I try to limit those as much as I possibly can. Jeremy. You know, you talked about the marriage and the divorce of particular horses, and I think that's an important thing is not only just your favorites, but horses you've won with in the past and and not being too committed to those horses in all situations. A good example is include Betty, a, a filly who I've caught in the fantasy at 18 to 1, and I also caught her at Tampa at 18 to 1. Sandwich in between was a race she had no chance to win because she's a one-run closer, and she needs a meltdown race. She's got great late brisk pace figures, and when races set up for her she's got a shot but when she gets in a race with no pace she's pretty much a throwout and i think you have to really keep those handicapping fundamentals together now i've cashed twice on a horse at 18 to 1 and if she comes back in the kentucky oaks unless there's a ton of pace in there she's probably a throwout i mean that's what she does and so i think as a horse player you've got to be realistic at what that horse is doing and not get caught up in the returns if you've been successful with one No, I completely agree. And uh, Jonathan, when uh, you're playing tournament, I got a question off the uh, off the chat applet uh, in terms of the pricing structure and uh, making decisions based on price and and having to you know build the bankroll toward a goal. Talk about that and and how that uh, is playing into your mental approach too because you're going to pick horses occasionally in the tournament setting that are you know strictly based on price and uh, you know then watch as maybe even a longer price horse you might have considered how do you gird yourself against those kinds of frustrations yes there's like you know there's three different settings there's the the all mandatory tournaments there's the optional tournaments and there's the mixture of the both of those and then there's the live bank 
One of the things that I think is one of mine, I've told this to Pete a few times when we've talked, I think one of the reasons that I've been successful over a certain amount of time is I try not to make rules for myself, which a lot of those tournament guys do. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm not taking a horse under 10 to 1, not taking a horse under 10 to 1. Well, I'll take a 5 to 2 horse if I know he's going to win. And, and there's been so many of my, these tournaments where if it wasn't for those 5 to 2 horses and taking them, that I wouldn't have won. Um, and so, so, you know, as a whole, I, I, I start to try to look at horses that are seven to one or above. I feel like that's just kind of my sweet spot. I don't know really why I do that. There's no mathematical reason for it. Um, but that's just generally where I start. Um, but at the same time, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow a five to two shot that has a distinct pace advantage and a class advantage beat me. Um, and I try not to do that. Um, like, for instance, this weekend when I was at Hawthorne, uh, it was a, five, a $400 live bank uh, bankroll structure, and you could bet it whenever you wanted, however you wanted. There was no rules about that portion of it. Well, my first bet of the day was my whole $400. I went all in on give me the loot at Santa Anita at even money, and then I had $800. And then I took 200 of that, and I did an exact, a cold exacto with Carpe Diem and Danzig Moon, and that turned me to 2400 so I didn't even have to. I didn't even have to get that cute when all these other people that are at these tournaments are, play, you know, they're trying to hit these seven to one and twelve to one shots. And I got into. I was in third place at that point. So I try not to make any rules to answer your question. Along, I I, I, don't, I look at the races and then I decide. Like um, Nick Tamaro and I and our, our friends and we're playing in the Keeneland tournament this weekend, and uh, we were just chatting about a strategy. And we won't have a strategy until I see the race because I have no idea what's going on. And so I, I think marrying yourself to an idea or a, or a structure that you're stuck to is problematic. And I think that's even if you're at the track on a Friday afternoon, you know, and, and you're a pick three player, you don't have to play every pick three. Maybe there's value in some other bet, or maybe you need to play the double in this situation or so on and so forth. And I, I think that's what kind of gets people in trouble is marrying themselves to a, a certain strategy or idea. When something is going in the other direction, and, and, and frankly, I mean, let's be honest, over the course of your introduction to the contest scene, really very little has gone wrong, and, and there has been you know, no, you know, that I'm aware of, protracted uh, uh, you know, series of setbacks and, and uh, beats, but you know, when they do come, what do you do to rally back uh, and and get uh, you know back on the positive side of the ledger mentally? Um, I, get, I usually will. I'll get up earlier. That's usually what I'll do. Is I'll work harder. I'll try to look at more races. Um, I'll tell myself if I'm having a bad if I have a bad week or I have a bad day, then the next week I'll tell myself I'm going to watch at least one replay of every horse in every race. It takes a it takes a long time and it's a lot of work but I feel more prepared going into it. So I just kind of work harder. I don't really change my strategy of like how I'm betting or whatever. I, I don't, I've never really found that that, because the truth is, is you don't have real money on the line and you handle it differently. You know, I, I've heard people say before, well, just take a step back and just kind of play on paper. Well, playing on paper, it's just, it's just a different, it's not the same thing. You, you look at things differently, you make different decisions. So that's what I try to do. I try to work a little bit harder. One of the other things I've done is, I will look at a product or a, um, a handicapping product that I've never used before. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll just kind of look at that supplementally to what I normally do to kind of inject some new ideas and thoughts into my head. And then some of those products have become, over time, have been, become staples in what I do. So um, that's, what I would, that's a recommendation I would make to people. They feel like they're in a slump or something. Just try, you know, try something like that. In fact, uh, the question did come up in the applet uh, about uh, the tools that uh, you use. Run down, uh, run down the you know the various elements uh, of the handicapping exercise and and what uh, you know all the different kinds of products that you want to incorporate. If they make a figure, I use it um, to a certain extent. I don't really use Thurgraph or the sheets or anything like that. Because, I, you know, I'm not saying that's not a good product, but I think the way that I handicap watching a lot of replays and using Trackus, to me, that if you could, that's kind of the same idea. They, they take so much into account the ground loss. Well, I do that visually. Um, so I, I kind of, it's not that I don't need it, but I, you know, I just, I've kind of never got used to it. Um, I'm a formulator guy through and through. That's the basis of what I do. 
Um, I, I will look at time for them occasionally. I think that's a really strong tool. Their figures are based on pace, um, well, they're pace infused. Um, I'm a huge workout report guy. Um, because, you know, when we're all looking at the PPs, we're looking at what horses did three and four weeks ago. When you look at the workout report, you're looking at what they did a week ago. And so to me, it's more relevant um, at times. Um, and it saves me time as well. You know, there's that horse we all are stuck with, that comeback horse from a big barn, and you have no idea what to do because you just don't know. He hasn't run in two years or something crazy like that. Um, that answers the question immediately. He's got strong works then, you know, you need to lean on him. If he doesn't, then you can throw and go in another direction. So um, that's pretty much it. I mean, the replays is one of the biggest things for me. Uh, I feel, you know, when I'm when I'm flying and handicapping and in-flight Wi-Fi does not let the replays work, it drives me crazy. So uh, I think that's probably my, my, my most important tool if I had to have something. You know, when it comes to handicapping and betting, there's two different sides to it and the slumps and the rolls and, and what's going well. Sometimes you're handicapping really well and, and you don't place the wagers properly. Sometimes you've structured good bets, but you're picking the wrong kind of horses. Recently, I was in about a two-week slump where I was about ready to get on my phone and ask Siri for the next pick. I mean, I just couldn't do anything right. And, and Keeneland came around, and I kind of feel that the homework comes back into it, like you're saying. And on Saturday, I put together a $3 pick four ticket. I mean, just six combinations. And that hit at 14 to 1, essentially, paying 42 for every three. And instead of spreading out all over the ballpark, that's what kind of turned my weekend around and my slump around. And hitting that multiple times, able to come back then in some of the later races and score bigger. I think the tendency when you're going bad is to spread, spread, spread for people. But that's not always the best case. I don't know if you have any kind of specific thought on that process. But to me, the sequence makes the sequence, not whether you're hot or cold. So if you think it's a narrow sequence, bet it narrowly. Right. No, I, and I, I, I always tell myself, and I've, this is something I've started to kind of do like the last couple of years, is am I hoping that this horse is going to run or do I think this horse is going to run? And if I, if I, if I lean towards hope, then I just throw the horse out because in the yeah. long run, at the end of the day, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, all those combinations that you waste on horses that you hope are going to run to make value in your play are going to cost you more money, you know, and it's going to, it's going to hurt your, your ROI at the end of the year. So I just, I just leave them out and I'd rather spend $24 instead of $72. And if I'm right, I'm right. If I'm wrong, I've only lost 24. I can place three more down, you know, three more pick threes or three more tries or, or whatever. So um, I, I agree with you. Get skinny when, when in doubt, just when in doubt, get skinny. Don't, you know, don't hit the all button. I make agree, it, especially when the multi-race wagers. And a lot of people want to put together A's, B's, and C's and ticket makers and all this stuff. My theory is if you're betting a C, why are you betting a C? I mean, if you just focus on your A's, who you would call quote-unquote A's, most of the time when you're right, you're right. And if you're not, then you're better off spending 20% or 80% less than you would have trying to reach for those C's. So you and I are kind of in the same boat with that uh, when it comes to multi-race wagers. Yeah, I think, I think people play C's out of fear. And and I don't mean that like in a in a, like in a, like I'm not trying to talk bad about anyone. I mean I, I'm guilty of it as well. I've done it before. You do it out of fear. You're like, oh, I don't want this twenty to one shot to beat me, and I didn't have it, so I'm going to use it. And I, that's fear. And so, like at the NHC, you know, when I, I did so well with both entries, it's because when I had strong opinions, I played them on both. When other people historically have just fearfully used horses that they were scared were going to beat them in those spots. And so when they did beat them, they would have a ticket that keeps moving up. And I just, I try not to play that way. I feel like it's, you know, not that I'm the greatest handicapper in the world, but we all work hard at this and I want to get better at it. And so the best way to get better at it is to take stands and learn from your mistakes. Well, and that's the you know that is the probably the the most important takeaway, uh, Jonathan, is the ability to, uh, distill the experiences and learn from them and, and not repeat them. No, oh, absolutely. And, and I'm really not one of those people that, that when the race may cross the wire and uh, I ran ninth, eighth and seventh, I don't open up the PPs and look, I don't, I just don't do that. Um, and, it, and I don't know why I don't do it. It's almost like, because I don't want to soak in the, in the thought of why I just messed up. So to, so to go back and, and to look every time you miss, I think sometimes it's just, 
it doesn't do a lot for your psyche, especially in the moment. You know, if there's a race, I'll go back later maybe and look at it. But generally, I don't even do that. You know, you're going to miss more than you hit. So just expect that it's going to happen and go to the next one. Well, that's it. And, you know, you, you can just tell those listening to you know, the way Jonathan approaches the game, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's just the, the hard work and uh, the dedication to being as prepared as possible. And, you know, that alone should take you take anybody a long way. And just being armed with the tools that uh, are at your disposal to make the best decisions you can and. And, uh, you know, to not, you know, not get overwhelmed when things don't go the way you hope, because there's so many things out of your control once they put them in the gate and being cognizant of the fact that, you know, we are, we are betting our money on 1100 pound animals that, <laughs> can uh, be capable of all kinds of of odd behavior and uh, you know certainly uh, people that uh, that felt lord nelson couldn't lose on saturday in the bay shore and built the bets through him uh, you've got to come away jonathan uh, you know feeling like you know, you, you you did something wrong, and uh, you know the gods are, are are punishing you after a, a circumstance like that. Well, if you got beat by Lord Nelson, it's because you weren't listening to Steve's show and Nick Tamaro gave out. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't feel sorry for you about that. Uh, I love it. Well, and, and I think even I think even Nick, uh, even Andy Serling today, who also uh, uh, liked March, was 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 quite capable of of saying that uh, uh, the probably you know probably was a little lucky. But look, that is and that's uh, that's the the proverbial the branch Ricky quote uh, that, uh, you know, should hang on walls, which is luck is the residue of design. And, uh, you know, you, you put yourself in a position to get lucky and, you know, being, being aware that March was a viable inclusion or a viable key horse or, uh, you know, the, the, the logical alternative uh, to the most likely quote unquote. And, and you go from there and uh, to me, a lot of this is is just experience and self confidence that shouldn't be limited just to playing horses. It's it's really something that you know will carry people well throughout life in general. Yeah, you know, you can't be scared to make mistakes. You know, I you, that's just that's going to happen. <laughs> and so, and I think that the people that that get themselves in tough situations when it comes to horses and gambling and is, is they're not prepared when they go into it. They're not prepared to make those mistakes. They're not prepared for the losses. And then they either press or do something that's even, they do something disastrous that could cause a lot of confusion for them and their lives. You know, you just, you're going to miss. <laughs> so you just got to accept that when you, when you go to the turnstile at the track, you're going to, you know, are you log into your deal? You're going to miss. So you just got to be right enough time to pay for the fun. A couple of quick uh, questions before we wrap up too, Jonathan, uh, give us uh, some thoughts as we arc toward the triple crown season uh, in terms of affection uh, for some of the three-year-olds that you think uh, are moving in the right direction and, and have uh, you know, running styles and, and have uh, an approach that could play out uh, ideally uh, for Derby. Yeah, so I've done something different than I've done in the past. I've already declared to everyone that I'm a huge fanboy. And so, like, in the past, I've fallen in love with all these horses that have continuously let me down. Verrazano, Sydney's Candy, Soul Bat. Like, all these horses that, like, I thought were going to run so well because I fell in love with them at a mile and the 16th, and then they just they crushed my dream. So I've tried to reserve judgment as long as possible. And... um Although I wanted to, I wanted Dubai Sky just because I was a, I was a Toil and Candy fan, and so um, I really just I really want, was hoping that he would get in. I knew that Mott wouldn't run him if he wasn't right, but unfortunately he got hurt. Um, I, I really think, and maybe I always do this, so don't run to the windows. But I really think American Pharaoh is special. I think that everyone surrounding Baffert is they're like talking out of the side of their mouth, and no one will say it, but they're all kind of saying it that he's better. And if he's better than that other horse, 
then he's something special. Because Dortmund is the real deal. And, um, and you know, if, if, you look at, if you look at the NBC interview, Martin Garcia was, like, stumped when they asked him about it because he works both of them. And he pretty much was like, ah, Dortmund, you kind of got to da 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 But American Pharaoh, he just does whatever, he just does whatever you ask him to do. So um, I'm going to be a huge fan on Derby Day, and I'm going to root for American Pharaoh so because I'm going to Belmont, and I want to see a triple crown just like we all do. So that's, that's where I'm going to lay my loyalties for now. Um, I, I was huge on Bolo. He let me down a little bit. So uh, we'll just have to see moving forward what happens from there. One other question I just see on the applet that we didn't get to, and I don't want to uh, leave this out. Uh, Colonel Mike is asking about Trackus and uh, how you employ the statistics and uh, the Trackus charts and uh, the information that's gleaned. Yeah, so Trackus to me is that's one of the biggest things that I use, um, and I, I probably downplayed it because I don't want anyone to know that because we're all playing against each other. But since he asked, I think it's one of the strongest tools. Um, it, it, it really tells a story. Um, one of the things that I've done, and I encourage people to do it, because I know a lot of people won't do it because it's a ton of work, but what I did was I took every race at a certain distance, at a certain track, and entered in the track of information based on each split. So I have on an Excel sheet the average, you know, second quarter of a six furlong race at Santa Anita or whatever. And so I know if it was faster than the average or slower than the average. And that's not something that is easy to do without having trackers. I also have the average feet traveled for seven furlongs at Santa Anita. So I know if they went, this is, this, this numbers would be wrong. I'm just throwing it out there. If they went 5,000 feet, that that's shorter than the average. And so if I see a, a figure that's close with between two horses, then I'll compare that to see who actually travels further and upgrade a horse that travels further. So, um, I use it all the time to, to, to find hidden trips, to find horses that were closing late, um, losing ground, all that stuff. So I, it's, it's huge. I have it open. I have a bookmark with all the, all the racetracks with their track is saying. And when I'm watching replays, I open it at the same time, and I, and, I, and I look over at it. I think it's huge. Well, this has been, uh, as always, an uh, entertaining and uh, fast-moving visit. Uh, Jonathan, uh, heading to Keeneland uh, for the Grade 1 uh, uh, Challenge, and uh, look forward to seeing you here along the way as soon again, and uh, always watching for your name on the leaderboard uh, week to week on the contest uh, front, and uh, already, I think you got, do you have both, or just the one, one or both of the entries already for you got well, there. I don't mean I don't mean to brag, but I got no. I'm just kidding. I, I have both, um, and I'm currently leading the tour, so I'm trying to I'm trying to stay up top. I, mean, I know people. Eric Mooney's coming for me. There's lots of people that declared they're coming. So uh, I'm uh, I'm trying to defend my honor and thank God my wife's letting me travel a little bit to try to do that. Well, uh, everybody, uh, look for Jonathan and uh, for Nick uh, at the Grade One uh, Gamble at Keeneland this weekend. Nick, uh, uh, give uh, you guys are you guys are like uh, all over the place, right? You had Vegas. You went uh, you went out for the Orleans, and uh, did, did Nick didn't go to Chicago, did he? No, Nick didn't go to Chicago. I stayed with my friend uh, Eric Violet. But no, Nicky the Boss was. Uh, it's been awesome being able to hang out with him, and I was there for his Breeders' Cup success. He was there for my NHC, and so uh, we become uh, really good friends and really close friends and running mates. And so uh, we're uh, looking more to get to Santa Anita in, in, in May and do this one in Keeneland. So we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Jonathan Kinchin, everybody, and uh, you can follow him on Twitter, uh, K-I-N-C-H-E-N.